Welcome back to the second episode of our two-part series on the West Virginia Mine Wars. If you haven't listened to part one yet, we recommend you go back and do that first. When the Union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the Union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Before we start off, just a reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merch and other benefits. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. At the end of the last episode, following a series of violent strikes in the Kanawha coalfields, we ended with the infamous Battle of Mate 1 when union-busting agents from the baldwin Feltz Detective Agency attempted to arrest pro-union police chief Sid Hatfield. The battle left ten dead, two miners, one of whom was unarmed, the town mayor and seven baldwin Feltz detectives. After the shootout, Sid Hatfield and 22 other people, mostly striking miners, were charged for the killings of the detectives. Seven defendants had their cases dismissed, but Hatfield and 15 others were subsequently put on trial in what became the lengthiest murder trial in the history of the state. The trial began on the 28th of January 1921, and on that day, 40 armed Baldwin Feltz detectives assembled in the street outside the courthouse in a pretty blatant attempt to intimidate the jury. But this was unsuccessful. In the end, they could not find a jury that would convict Sid Hatfield and the others of murdering the Baldwin Feltz agents. All of the defendants were acquitted at trial by a jury who basically knew what Baldwin Feltz detectives did and what they were like. The New York Times reported that on the day the defendants came back from trial, the entire population of Mate 1 came to the railway station to greet them. They quote one rugged mountaineer as declaring, quote, It is the happiest day Mate 1 ever knew. They also reported that it took Hatfield more than an hour to travel 100 metres from the station to his house, as everyone wanted to shake his hand. And they said that Hatfield's right hand was swollen from the, quote, hearty grasps of his neighbours. The legal case over. Struggles in the coal fields continued. So over the next year, there were a lot of small skirmishes and there were even some coal tipples that were blown up by the miners. Tipples are also known as coal prep plants. They're basically structures in which coal gets transferred from the mine into railway cars. In fact, Sid Hatfield and his deputy Ed Chambers were indicted for blowing up one of the coal tipples. Whether or not they actually had anything to do with it is is doubtful, but this was a way to put them back on trial. And in this case, they got the trial, the coal operators got the trial relocated to McDowell County, which they knew would be um, more in their control. And in fact, it didn't even get to the trial. Sid and Ed traveled by train to Welch, West Virginia, and they got off the train and went to their hotel. They left their hotel unarmed, and they went to the courthouse, and C.E. Lively, a spy for the baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, led a group of agents, and, and they killed them on the courthouse steps in front of their wives. Lively and the other baldwin Feltz agents were also later acquitted of murder on the grounds of self-defence, even though both Hatfield and Chambers were unarmed when they were killed. Coal mining is a very male-dominated industry, but women have always played a really key role in industrial disputes in mining communities. For example, we discussed the role of women in the 1984-5 British miners' strike in our episode 13. West Virginia was no different in this respect. Women, of course, couldn't be minors because of superstitions, um, and also uh, sometimes the law just prohibited it. Um, but there, um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't very involved in these disputes. In fact, they they led these disputes in numerous ways. So they wrote songs for one thing. Some of the most iconic and incredible. Um, works of art that came out of these disputes were written by women. They picketed 
they attacked strike breakers and coal company officials because they could, in a sense, sometimes get away with more because they were uh, because of their gender. Um, you know, during Paint Creek Cabin Creek strike, um, this woman named Sarah Blizzard, um, an older woman, led a mob that attacked strike, strike breakers with broomsticks. Right? She also led a group of women to tear up the railroad tracks after the Bull Moose Special came in, so that they could never come back. Um, so these were militant, you know, this was militant involvement. Um, they, they, they participated in gunfights even um, occasionally. Um, and they also demanded that their, the males in their families take action. Um, because, you know, you have to think about, you know, for women, their workplace was the coal camp. So if we're talking about all these elements of the coal camp life, that were eventually building and leading up to all this frustration and, and, and injustice on the part of the miners, really the women were on the front lines of the, of the coal camp. So they were the ones who went to the company store and, and saw the prices that were so high. And they were the ones who cut the script and saw how their wages were being, you know, um, uh, they were the ones who had to haul the water because the water was five blocks away. They were the ones who had to clean everything that was so dirty in the coal camp. So their very lives were enmeshed in, in the, this struggle in a very real way. And so it's, it's perhaps not surprising that they, in many instances, were the ones goading the men along. Like, let's get some change here. Like, let's demand something more. Um, they also worked as organizers. Um, people like, of course, Mother Jones is the most famous, but there were also people like Fanny Sellins and Nellie Spinelli and Sarah Blizzard um, who, who, who worked as organizers. I think women also bore part of the brunt of the, like, the sort of psychological stress of, of the coal industry. I mean, males were the ones going underground and facing death every day, but women were also facing the death of husbands and loved ones every day. And if they lost a, a husband or a loved one, their lives were, they'd be struggling even more. So they had to kind of deal with this, um, the stress of possibly losing a husband or their children. Um, you know, so coupled with housing and economic instability and this um, sort of debt peonage system, um, you can see how, you know, they would be um, willing to take a risk to win some gains, but they could not be a part of the union. They were barred from being a part of the union at the time. We spoke to one of the participants in the Battle of Mate One reenactment about her character, which dramatised the experiences that many miners' wives lived through at the time. Hi, uh, so uh, what's your name? My name's Ali Paxton. Okay, and um, can you tell me about your character today? Well, my character is the coal miner's wife to uh, Charlie Kelly's coal miner. And we kind of play it off as... She was the mouthpiece. He was the silent, strong stone that that kept her going. And we were part of the of the families that were evicted that day on May 19, 1920. And it was a brutal time because they the Bowenfelts they were doing a job, but they did it viciously. And it didn't matter if you had children in the house. It didn't matter if you had elderly in the house, sickly. Every, everything was gone. You had to go. It didn't matter if you had so much stuff, they'd throw it out for you. Um, one of the lines that I have in the play, it talks about the conditions that the, t that the coal miners that were in the union had to deal with once they were evicted. And these uh, families were put in tents together and Sally and Jesse would bring food to the tent colonies and when nightfall came, they would have the armored train come through and there would be more thugs on the train and they would shoot into the tents. And one of the most, fa the mo the most books that con con connects with me is Which Side Are You On? And it's a song from Kentucky that talks about a woman who was in the tent colony and she was experiencing what they were going through and how they would come by and they would shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And she wrote this song in her house as she was being shot at with her children and herself under the bed. Workers, can you stand it? Oh, tell me how you can. Will you be a lousy scam? Or will you be a man? Or which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Are you on? 
and it connects with this, the coal miner's wife and her story because she was thrown out at gunpoint and then she had to live in the conditions of the tent colonies when they would drive the, the armored train through and they would shoot and shoot and shoot and it didn't matter if there were children in the in the colony it didn't matter if there were elderly that couldn't walk or couldn't be were able to get to shelter quick enough they just shot into it it was very brutal and like her husband says in the play she her husband was a patriot he were he fought in world war one and they didn't care that he was a veteran he didn't care they were going to shoot at they were going to kick him out just as much as they were going to kick anybody else out which side are you on was written by florence reese the wife of a UMW organizer during a miner strike in Harlan County, Kentucky. Just over a year after the Mate One shootout, the Battle of Blair Mountain occurred. Its centenary has just taken place, and a whole series of events was organized to commemorate it, with lots of work on that done by the Wine Wars Museum. It's definitely one of the more famous incidents of the Mine Wars, although it's still little known relative to its importance. So all this stuff that we've been talking about, these 20 years of ongoing strikes and guerrilla warfare and resentment and violence, it all comes to a head um, in an incident that we call the Battle of Blair Mountain, which was the largest armed insurrection in U.S. history since the Civil War. And you saw 10,000 armed Unionist coal miners go up against a force, and these numbers are approximate, a force of about 3,000 company officials. So how all this went down was um, after Sid Hatfield and Ed Chambers were murdered, that was at the beginning of August, 1921. By the end of August, the miners had also presented a set of demands to the governor and they were agitating for some some more gains. Uh, The governor rejected those demands. And so that along with Sid Hatfield's murder really set off this spark that would uh, lead to a series of events that would culminate in this huge battle. Um, So, End of August, beginning of September, the miners uh, get a call from their district and their locals, and it starts to spread through Kanawha Valley, through New River. We're going to gather at Marmette, okay? So they start mustering. And many of these, uh, or some of these uh, miners were World War I veterans and occasionally would even show up in their army fatigues and and have their, you know, U.S. issued uh, firearms. So they were gathering along the river in a place called Marmette. Um, there'd be speeches there and you know townspeople were coming too because this was a spectacle you know this wasn't every day that you see this like big mob and and so um people were set up with camps and there's campfires and um and mother jones comes and there's speeches and all this um so eventually the miners set off from marmette and where they're going is they're they're headed to mingo county where a lot of their union brothers were being kept under martial law Uh, in jail, really without due process. And so this was intolerable to them. This is not the first time it had happened and they were tired of it and they wanted to free these men. Um, They also, so Mingo County was on the other side of Logan County, which was the last anti-union stronghold in Southern West Virginia at that time. I mean, Mingo was in the process, but It was one of the most strong anti-union counties left in Southern West Virginia. And it was controlled by um, uh, a man named Don Chafin, who was the sheriff, and he was also paid by the coal companies to keep the union out. And he did a very good job of it. (laughs) So to get to Mingo, they had to go through Logan County. So they set off from Marmette, they march for, um, uh, they march 50 miles. Um, Their plan is to go through Kanawha County, go through Boone County, go through Logan County, unionize Logan County as they go. Some of them wanted to murder Don Chafin and then get to Mingo. And so one of their rallying cries was on to Mingo. That's where they were going to go, right? So they go on this march and along the way, even their union uh, leaders tell them to turn around, um, that, that this has gotten out of hand. You need to just go back home. And some of them do. And then they get called back and it's kind of a mess. And people are like on trains and, and, and they're hoofing it on foot. And sometimes they, they're in cars. So it's just, I mean, it's really a battle zone. I mean, it looks like a war is happening in this area. And it was. So they're heading there and they get to the foot of Blair Mountain. And Blair Mountain is a big mountain that separates Union territory from anti-Union territory in Logan County. So the miners to get to Mingo County have to go through, go 
cross that mountain. And Logan County guys know it. So they start to rally and they get a whole bunch of guys um, to, to go up the mountain on the other side and take in positions up on this ridge line. You have to imagine a long ridge line like a backbone where they're, where they're setting up um, 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 machine guns and nests, right? Where they can fire down on the miners who they assume are gonna start to charge up that mountain to get past them. So the, the people, the, the men in, the, in Logan County who are, who are gonna be fighting the miners, they see their role as defending their home from these anarchist re rebels, right? Like they're for law and order, they wanna keep the peace, you know, they, that's how they see themselves um, fighting this, this, this you know, uh, chaos that these miners are bringing. So they uh, do in fact um, end up clashing along this ridgeline and they fight for five days um, with machine guns, rifles, all manner of, of weaponry. Don Chafin, the sheriff of Logan County, chartered private planes to drop homemade essentially kind of pipe bombs with like nails and nuts and bolts and stuff filled uh onto the strike onto the 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 fighters um the 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 miners who were fighting and these bombs some of them did explode um no one was hurt but yeah there's still like famous photographs from the time of like miners holding up this bomb right um so it was very dramatic and and these things start, you know started to make national headlines for sure the miners, in order to identify themselves to each other, um, wore red bandanas around their necks or on their arms as a kind of a badge or a symbol that they were on the Union side. Um, and many of the other side were wearing black armbands to differentiate themselves. These red bandanas were the reason for the miners being referred to as the, quote, redneck army. And that term redneck as being applied to um, unionists goes back to, I think, a railroad strike in West Virginia in the 1800s sometime. Folk wisdom tells us that like the term redneck comes from this battle and from the Pink Creek, um, Cabin Creek strike, where the red bandana came to symbolize solidarity, working together um, um, for, for the greater good. In general, use of the term redneck was recorded before this time, but it wasn't a term in widespread use. Around the era of the mine wars, the term was popularized, and much of its use was in demonizing union and communist workers. So this radical origin is a key part of the history of the term redneck. About five days into the fighting, US troops show up who have been deployed from, from throughout the East Coast. They come in on trains, um, they're wearing their uniforms. And of course, when the mine, they, they come from both directions and to try to do this kind of pincher movement to cut off both sides, right? It's kind of a classic military movement, I, I guess. As soon as the miners see the US troops, they surrender. Because remember that some of them just got done fighting in a World War I. So these were their army brothers, right? So they're not gonna fight the US government. That's not who they have a beef with. They have a beef with the private companies that employ them. It has nothing to do with the US government is how they saw it. So um, they see the US government as their saviors, come in to stand up for them and fight for what they want. Meanwhile, the other side also sees the US government as the savior who's come in to put in law and order and, and get what they want. So uh, fortunately, there was no more bloodshed because both sides were willing to very quickly surrender um, to the federal troops that came in. However, despite the miners thinking that the US government would support them, they did not. As in almost all other historical examples, while the federal government pretends to be neutral in industrial disputes, in reality it intervenes nearly always on behalf of the employers. In the end, the Battle of Blair Mountain ended in defeat for the workers and their union. After the fighting was over, 200 plus miners were indicted for treason, some were indicted for murder. Ultimately, only a handful went to prison and even there, um, some of the people who were convicted of murder had their uh, sentences commuted after about a decade. Um, but this was devastating for the Union. The Union's membership dropped to historic lows in the 1920s. District 17 had to give up its autonomy to the international office. Frank Keeney and Fred Mooney left the Union. Um, and 
Throughout the 20s, miners had to go back to work in the company towns and dangerous conditions. There were some attempts to kind of ameliorate the worst parts of company town life, but the miners would have to wait very patiently for another opportunity to organize for more than a decade. And that would not come until 1933, when under Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, Congress passed the National uh, Industrial Recovery Act, which included a section that recognized the right of workers to unionize. Fred Mooney and Frank Keeney, you may remember from part one, were militant local union activists. The National Industrial Recovery Act would be introduced following a massive wave of working class struggles with the background of the Great Depression, which began in 1929. Despite taking place a century ago, the legacy of the Battle of Blair Mountain continues to this day. For instance, in 2018, during the statewide wildcat strike of West Virginia teachers, many strikers wore the red bandanas made famous during the battle. It was super fascinating to see that. And you saw all sorts of signs of it during the strike. Like there would be um, literally signs of Mother Jones quotes, right? Um, uh, I saw a bunch of like insignia of Mother Jones on shirts. Um, people were um, talking about the, the, the union organizing that happened back then. Many of these teachers were West Virginia history teachers. And so I talked to a fair number of them who were literally seeing history sort of come alive in front of them. Um, I mean, the parallels were kind of crazy. Like um, during the West Virginia teacher strike, at a certain point, the union leadership decided, okay, we're gonna take this deal with the governor, strikes over. Well, the rank and file said, uh-uh, like, we don't trust that this promise is going to, you know, really happen. And so they continued their strike beyond what their district leadership, um, so, so it was, became this wildcat strike, which is very similar to what happened in Paint Creek, for example. And so these parallels started cropping up to where you're saying, whoa, like, this really is, like, you know, history in some cases uh, repeating itself or, or mirroring itself or reflecting back. Um, and so I think I think the women who... And they were largely women who are leading this strike were were fairly reflective about that. And um, um, I don't want to take all the credit, but I do think that the, the existence of the museum has allowed that conversation to come out more than it has in the past. Um, we try our best to use social media and all, all means that we can um, to to get this story out into the world. Ali Paxton, who we spoke to earlier from the Battle of Mate One reenactment, was one of the many teachers taking part in the West Virginia strike. I was on the front line with the rest of the teachers in Charleston. We were on strike for nine days. It was a very stressful time. I mean, we didn't know if we were going to get the support that we did. We were very lucky that we had our superintendent's support. We had 55 counties' support. If there had been just one county that said, no, we're not going out, we wouldn't have gotten the success that we did. It fills me with awe that we, that I was, I got to be a part of the shot across the world, as Donna likes to say, with the coal mine, because Mingo County started the coal mine wars, and Mingo County started the teacher strike, and it makes me feel good that I stood up for what I believed in, my fellow teachers stood up for what they believed in, and we actually accomplished what we were looking for. We still have a long way to go. And we have told them, if we have to, we'll go out again. We're gonna get it done. And as long as we have that mentality of we're gonna get it done, it's gonna get done. We also spoke with Hilary Hall, another striking West Virginia teacher who played Mother Jones in the reenactment. I am a striking teacher from West Virginia, Mingo County, so that kind of is a little bit of personal involvement. It's actually what got me involved in this, so that was an, a nice connection. I'm very prideful about the area I grew up in, and I am a very strong union member, and I spent a lot of time in Charleston on our strike. So getting to play Mother Jones was a, a big deal for me. I am one of the newest cast members. I, I kind of got thrown in about three weeks ago. But it was it was meant so much to be asked and to be part of this. It started way back in the middle of January, and it started here. We were having meetings before anyone else did. We went out for a one-day um, kind of work stoppage deal um, before anyone else, with along with McDowell County and Wyoming County. So it was very nice to be a part of that. 
We spent nine days on the lawn. We met all kinds of people from all walks of life, and we were all together on getting our health benefits fixed and getting a raise, making sure that we had high-quality teachers um, for our posterity. We asked Hillary and Ali whether they felt any connections between the West Virginia teacher strike and the events of the mine wars a century before. Absolutely. Of course, we're not out in the streets having to physically fight, but as far as we have to be strong mentally, we can't fold into not having a union anymore. We had gotten so complacent right before all this happened this year. So it seems like they're trying to say the same things to us that some of the mines did before. One of the things in our health benefit plan, they were trying to do this thing where we would walk so much and we could earn rewards. And it was almost like having script, like the, you know, not to the degree that they experienced, but it was a lot like it. And we got to the point of saying, really, you can't pay for our health benefits, but you can give us an Amazon gift card for whatever. <laughs> so there is a definite connection. It had an effect to me. I have been telling this story for seven years. I've been on this cast for seven years. And yes, I had a personal connection to the character herself, but now I have a connection to what the miners went through to get what they got, to get us what we have now. And it was just, it was amazing. It was, it was out of this world just being able to experience it, being there, holding each other's hand, watching as thousands of teachers were shouting and protesting at the same time. And then when I came back to do the play and practice and getting into character, it means so much more now because I know how, I know I can stand up for what I believe in now and I know what they, like, I really get into headspace of what they were going for. For years now, the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum has been doing really indispensable work keeping the memory of the mine wars alive. Here, Catherine explains the work they do and why it's so important. One of the problems um, is that there really has not been um, much of a memory of this incident, and, and that that's due to a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it was taboo is um, because of these treason trials that Lou mentioned, uh, you know, people were being accused of murder and treason, and this wasn't something that you really wanted to brag about in your family, and so um, they, they were kind of vilified after the fact in some cases uh, by the by the press. Not all, all of them, but um, or not all the press, but, but they were, and so the stories that did survive I believe really survived within families that were told, you know, around the dinner table or special occasion. But there really was never a, pl a public place to go to memorialize what happened, to talk freely about it, um, to ask questions about it, and, and really dig into it. And so our museum aims to be that place where people can come, and many of the people who come have relatives who were involved. and. Uh, we get stories all the time of people coming in um, whose granddaddy fought in the Battle of Blair Mountain. And I think for them, it's pretty affirming to have a place where they can see that this stuff really did matter, that it was this nationally significant event, um, that, that people are paying attention, that it's being remembered, and that the, those who struggled and, and died in, 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 you know, in these conflicts you know, do have a legacy, and there is a memory of what they did. Um, so we strive to be that memorial, I mean, to, this is just me speaking too, we strive to be that place to remember. So we do all sorts of stuff. We have um, history events, we have um, uh, sort of parties, we host um, uh, movie screenings of Mate One, we had John Sales come last year. Um, uh, we try to, we're working on education program, we've developed curriculum, um, curricula to, to um, for West Virginia public school teachers um, that I think is going to be a, a big success for us. Um, and what am I forgetting? We publish a journal, we have a membership program, so you can definitely become a part of this. The number one way that you can support what we do is by becoming a member of the museum. And you can do that on our website at wvminewars.com.
www.thelightsofdreamsbrewing.org. Um, and it's a, a yearly fee, and that literally is what keeps the lights on at the museum. My daddy was a miner, now he's in the air and sun. He'll be with you, fellow workers, until the battle's won. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? That concludes our double episode on the West Virginia Mine Wars. We've also got a great selection of books about the Mine Wars in our online shop. Just see the link in the show notes. And as a listener to the podcast, you can get 10% off the cost of them or anything else in the store using the discount code WCH podcast with no spaces. As always, we've got sources, links to more info, photos, transcripts, further reading and more on the webpage for this episode. Link in the show notes. Also on the webpage for this episode, we have a link to watch the film Mate One. It's well worth a watch, although listeners should bear in mind that it fictionalizes certain details. For example, the main character in the film is union organizer Joe Keenahan, who is fictional. In actual fact, the main black miner depicted in the film, Few Clothes Johnson, was an outside organizer with the UMWA and was a key strike leader in the Paint Creek and Cabin Creek strike some years before. It also contains a fictionalized and highly problematic storyline around a sexual assault allegation. Again, this podcast is only made possible because of support from you, our listeners on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash history. Link in the show notes. Supporters get great benefits like early access to episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes, free and discounted books and merch, and more. Thanks to all of our existing Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Connor Kanatsi, Shay, James, Ariel Joya, and Stone Lawson. Music used in these episodes was Which Side Are You On? by Florence Reese, performed by The Night Watchman, Tom Morello, and Solidarity Forever by Ralph Chaplin, performed by David Rovix. Link to buy and stream them in the show notes. This episode was edited by Tyler Hill. Finally, thanks to all of you for listening. Catch you next time. Don't scab for the bosses. Don't listen to their lies. Poor folks ain't got a chance unless they organize. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on?